Welcome to Richard McLean. Richard kindly volunteered a few weeks ago to give this experiment a whirl. Richard was due to talk to us on the 7th, sorry, 8th of April, but we had to um, cancel it because of the coronavirus. So Richard then came back and said, well, why don't we give it a go vir uh, virtually? So here we are. Um, Richard, you will be known to many, many of you as, as uh, currently the managing director of Grand Central, but has also done some other very high visibility um, jobs around the rail network uh, in the days of British Rail, since privatisation GNER. A few of you may know that he was also the managing director of Tyne and Weir Metro for a while. What's that? Oh, no, 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 no. To, um, no, no, go eat your cheery. What to make of, of that? Go get um, Rachel, she get you food. So Richard now leads one of Britain's open access to to come down to me Central, and to get you um, who've also embarked on a number of innovative projects, including this one. So, um, Richard, over to you. Thank you, Louise, and, and thank you to all the participants uh, on, on this uh, experimental approach. I've, I've had a few uh, Zoom calls over the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, a, a Zoom pub crawl, two, pu two quizzes, uh, but this is the first time uh, I've done a, a formal lecture with, uh, uh, for an institution. So here we go. Um, just like to start off with by saying a few words about Grand Central as a business, uh, where we came from and what we do, uh, to put some of the, uh, the te technical pieces uh, at the later part into context. Buttons to work. Uh, right, sorry, I overpressed. So, first of all, as Louis said, Grand Central is an open access operator, uh, which means we operate without uh, a contract with government. Uh, we operate, therefore, on a fully commercial basis, with our costs being covered by passenger revenue. Uh, in effect, we have contracts with the whole supply chain. Uh, but the one that matters is the contract we have with the people who travel on our trains. Uh, the business was founded in 2007 uh, and uh, was running trains at that stage between London and Sunderland, adding a route to Bradford uh, in 2010. Uh, Arriva bought the business from its founding, uh, founding fathers in 2011, and we've been expanding and growing the business uh, since then. We now operate a fleet of 10 Class 180 Atlante trains. Uh, those of you with long memories will recall that these were uh, the products, the last products to come out of the Washwood Heath plant in Birmingham uh, from Alstom, uh, and were originally built, designed and built uh, for the Great Western franchise uh, back in the 90s. Our timetable, uh, now has 18 services a day. Um, and we're a challenger brand on the East Coast main line, uh, working alongside LNER and another open access operator, Hull Trains, providing passengers with choice on the route. We deliver documented high levels of customer satisfaction. And our growth continues uh, with plans to open up uh, a third route, this time on the West Coast Main Line to Blackpool. Now, some of you will know our, our services are actually currently suspended uh, in the context of the social distancing requirements in response to the COVID-19 uh, crisis that the nation's facing. Other train operators uh, who used to have franchise agreements are being supported by emergency contracts uh, in order to keep uh, services operating on the network on a skeleton basis for essential travel. Uh, the Department for Transport uh, concluded that uh, the routes we operated on uh, did not uh, require uh, essential travel connectivity to be maintained. Our focus is on passenger choice and focusing on our local markets. And in the last uh, uh, five years, we can see um, 
that what we've delivered very significant growth on all of our core uh, markets. And interestingly, what we can see happening is that growth is highest at stations where passengers have a choice of operator. In the last, uh, the autumn 2019 uh, National Rail Passenger Service, uh, we were again uh, identified as the number one uh, brand for customer satisfaction uh, and overall value for money and outstripping the sector uh, and the national picture. And don't just take my word for it. Uh, there was once upon a time a Secretary of State by the name of Grant Shap uh, sorry, uh, Chris Grayling, Grant Shapps' predecessor, who back in 2018 uh, very kindly said uh, that open access does make a difference on the network and that we make a particular difference in those local communities that we uniquely serve uh, on routes where other operators and the Department of Tran Transport have chosen not to provide services. So what makes us stand out? First of all, we have a very simple and consistent uh, series of, of guiding principles that underpin our decision making at, at every stage, both in the short term uh, and at, at a strategic level. These are the things we look for when we design processes, when we design equipment, when we select uh, business strategies, and when, when we select our people. But overall, our vision is to provide great value, enjoyable journeys that remove the limits on where people and businesses and communities can go. And we believe that great things happen when people get moving. And I think the recent experiences nationally of complete lockdown, uh, re-emphasizing how important connectivity, travel, and the ability to get places uh, is going to be to us. We work with a whole series of partners across our, all of our routes uh, embedding ourselves in the communities that we serve. The technical end, as I said, our fleet, our fleet now consists of five, oh, of 10 five coach class 180 diesel multiple units. Uh, these are non-tilting uh, diesel hydraulic um, uh, units, uh, the QSK19 uh, prime mover, uh, driving through a Voith hydraulic gearbox uh, onto a final drive on the bogey. Um, so they're very akin in terms of their platform and market positioning to Bombardier's Voyager fleet, uh, but there were only ever 14 of them built as they failed to secure a large uh, follow-on order from the original Great Western uh, deployment. Now for us as a business, uh, these trains are well sized for the routes we serve. Uh, they're high performance, 125 miles an hour, good acceleration and braking, uh, and can perform alongside uh, the new Azuma fleets uh, on the route. We have enough rolling stock in our fleet uh, of 10 uh, to meet our current market requirements and also to grow uh, on the East Coast. And shortly before um, the current crisis, we'd introduced a 10 car operation on a Friday uh, to meet peak demand. And we were about to launch a sixth daily service uh, from Sunderland, uh, growing into the platform of the fleet we have. We've used the uh, 10 trains uh, to support a number of engineering programs over the recent recent years. Uh, this fleet has just completed uh, retrofitment of ETCS equipment, uh, making it the first uh, major fleet to be completely refitted. Um, we've also uh, undertaken a 10 million pound refurbishment program and are just as literally as we speak now, uh, fitting overhauled uh, air conditioning equipment in preparation for the restart of the business. Hello, Richard. Say again. Okay, going on. So, um, but one thing to highlight and to um, 
that will be relevant as we go forward is that we are now the only diesel fleet operating into King's Cross in London. Um, as everybody else has moved away from HSTs uh, and uh, Hull trains have moved out of their subfleet of 180s, uh, we are the only people to bring a large uh, diesel prime mover into the station. Um, without the howling noise of a, a VP185, uh, we now stand out somewhat. As I said, we're about to launch a new service uh, on the West Coast Main Line from uh, Blackpool to Euston. Um, this would be a service of five trains a day, uh, the good spread of services throughout the day, um, linking uh, held down by diesel and gasoline. But not far off them, we see a group of uh, liquefied gas products, butane, propane, uh, and natural gas. Uh, I keep on looking at this graph and recognizing that fat metabolism is in the same sort of zone as diesel uh, and gasoline, but have decided that we cannot run the trains on Mars bars. And I haven't found sufficient unicorns to replace them. So hydrogen gets a lot of uh, airtime uh, because it's lovely stuff. It's very, very clean, no CO2. Um, it's actually based on quite old technology. The fuel cell was invented before the internal combustion engine. But people have been trying to find ways of producing cost-effective uh, uh, transportation based around uh, fuel cells and hydrogen for quite a long time. And what they're showing is that they can produce very heavy, very expensive vehicles, uh, but not as yet anything that works at an economic level unless you have significant political investment in the product. And it's great to see the stuff that's happening in Sledgewick Holstein uh, with the Alstom products, but whether that is a mature technology uh, for the UK is unclear at the moment, and it certainly isn't something that we could uh, contemplate in the context of continuing to develop existing assets. So, in some respects, we are in a happy place as an operator. We have a fleet that meets our immediate needs in terms of passenger requirements. It's the right size, it's got growth, it's efficient, it's relatively cost effective. It's, it operates on the basis of a great fuel with high energy density, really well developed logistics and infrastructure, uh, including outside the rail sector that we can just plumb into. And depots that have been practicing fueling um, storing fuel and, uh, uh, and fueling trains overnight for decades. But the context in which we're operating is one with increase, real and increasing concerns about emissions, particularly in stations and depots. Uh, you know, bottom line is that King's Cross Station at the moment uh, exceeds uh, the public limits, both for short and long-term exposure uh, to nitrous oxide and particulates. Uh, interestingly though, uh, it's very, very clear from the uh, survey work that's been done there that, that those uh, high levels of pollution uh, actually are, uh, have their origin outside the station and not from the trains inside. Decarbonization of all aspects of uh, public life are essential and transportation uh, no less. But moving to alternatives will incur, incur significant technical and economic risks. And as a small uh, commercial operator, that is not something we can embark on uh, unilaterally. So what we have been looking for is a cost-effective, deliverable improvement in what we do making maximum use 
of the assets we already have uh, and something that can be delivered relatively quickly uh, and affordably. So we didn't want to be, we didn't want to be in the place of inventing some rocket science. But on the other hand, we do have to make some positive steps. So what we identified was a study that RSSB had funded into what is called dual fuel operation. Now, in a dual fuel operation, you take an existing compression ignition diesel engine and you modify it so that it, work, it runs on a mixture of liquefied natural gas and diesel fuel. The operating cycle is that you inject the natural gas, the methane, into the induction, air induction circuit, into the induction manifold. That passes into the cylinders where it is compressed in exactly the same way as air would be compressed in a, a diesel engine normally. And then at the appropriate point in the compression cycle, you inject a small amount of diesel fuel as a pilot fuel, which then ignites and, ignite and further ignites the methane in the cylinder. The majority of the energy released from the fuel comes from the methane, from the liquefied natural gas. And the role of the diesel is to act as a, an igniter. What we see that delivering is uh, at, at levels where you've got 70% uh, substitution of diesel with natural gas, are fuel savings in the order of 30%, and depending on the duty cycle, between 28 and 44, 44% uh, carbon emission reductions. There's a lot less carbon in a molecule of methane than there is in a molecule of diesel. The noise runs quieter, uh, it runs cooler, uh, it's more kind on its lubrication systems as a result. What we see is that the um, entire uh, logistics chain is retrofitable uh, from well to wheel. Uh, people make liquefied natural gas today. You can buy it. It can be delivered. Um, there are equi there's equipment available off the shelf for um, fueling. And the engines can be converted relatively simply because all you're, you're doing is using existing manifolds and existing uh, circuitry, but you're adding an extra control side. It retains all the power and efficiency char characteristics of the original base diesel engine. So we uh, put our hands up and got ourselves involved in a stage two project, again funded by RSSB, in this case to deliver a practical in-service demonstration uh, of dual fuel operation. What, um, what we uh, set out to do was not to demonstrate that dual fueling works on a test rig, because uh, that's been done several dozens of times, but to demonstrate that a dual fueled engine could be created by modifying an existing engine that it works in service on an existing train that we could design and fit a combined diesel and LNG tank to go onto the train and that we could install and practically use an LNG fueling rig in an ordinary normal rolling stock depot environment. So in the pictures here, we've got a uh, uh, space envelope um, diagram. Uh, hopefully you can see the mouse moving, the pointer moving. So we're using the same space envelope of the existing fuel tanks uh, and then producing this combined module that has two 
LNG tanks surrounding a central diesel tank, the proportions reflecting the 70% uh, substitution rate. <coughs> we would also uh, procure and install uh, an LNG uh, fueling rig, in this case, uh, a modular off the shelf containerized uh, unit uh, that can be delivered and plonked down onto the depot off the back of a lorry. Um, and then not seen is do the modification work on the engine itself uh, and fit the appropriate control equipment. A uh, question that was asked is why, why go to the bother of having dual fueling? Uh, why, why not go straight to a spark ignition gas engine? Uh, the reason for that is we want to retain the uh, power output and fuel efficiency of the compression ignition cycle. And we also want to make use of the engines that we've already got, because modifying a QSK-19 to spark ignition uh, would be a considerably uh, more complex uh, and costly task. Uh, we, we do virtually no modifications to the engine itself. The modifications to the vehicle are the fuel tank and the um, uh, system that, in, that injects the gas into the intake manifold uh, and then the control unit that uh, alters the mixture uh, of the two, the two fuels. As they are partner in this is a specialist company called Gvolution. They are managing the overall project. Uh, they are providing uh, the, re the refueling infrastructure. Uh, they are delivering the uh, safety approvals process uh, and the installation. Well, we're looking after driver training and the maintenance aspects of it. Uh, our trial should have actually happened already, uh, but like many things in life, it's paused at the moment uh, with the challenges of managing COVID-19. So what have we found so far? Yet yeah, we've had to redo some of the um, test bed work uh, because we're using a QSK-19 uh, engine, whereas the uh, Earlier work was done on a smaller sprinter engine. Um, but we're, we're seeing that we can, using the space envelope of the existing fuel tank, um, optimize a substitution ratio uh, in order to deliver uh, the same range from our train um, and still deliver fuel cost savings of around 20%. Um, and uh, CO2 equivalent reductions of between 25 and 40%. Um, percent. Um, we are seeing particulate reductions on the test bed and our estimate at the moment with those fuel cost savings, uh, a payback from the conversion work uh, of less than five years. The, um, some of the differences we're noting here uh, or you can uh, also start thinking about using uh, biogas uh, as opposed to well uh, methane. So what have we learnt? Uh, this is a practical trial. We're doing this to demonstrate uh, effectiveness and uh, to find out what the bear traps are. Um, Great results from the test cell uh, we would, that we would not see a detriment to operational capability. But <clears throat> our real challenges come in the design side where the absence of any um, relevant rail standards uh, is a real challenge. Now, while you can read across from other sectors uh, that, uh, you know, uh, as, as a reference point, we're finding that that is not sufficient uh, to get through uh, safety approvals processes. So we are making use of the common safety method, which is a complex, time consuming, and I should have emphasized expensive process, but we're finding that very necessary uh, at this stage. Now, what we believe that this, you know, an RSSB support us, uh, this is actually very useful. 
because once we have demonstrated um, that this can all be done, it can be read across into parallel projects. And if we are going to go down the hydrogen route uh, with fuel cells or otherwise, we are going to have to deal with the uh, technology and safety and standards aspects of uh, dispensing and carrying um, cryogenic fuels on board trains. What we're also finding in our work is that novelty continues to be scary for railway folk. Even when you point out that the lorry that delivered their groceries to, um, uh, to Waitrose are also LNG dual fuels. Uh, as part of Waitrose environmental campaign, um, people get very scared about crashworthiness. You know, how can you fit methane tanks on a train? It, it'll blow up the moment you have a rough shunt in a station. What happens in a crash? What happens when you run over a shopping trolley? Uh, I would be very, very confident in saying that perhaps the only bit of the train left after a massive crash would be the fuel tanks. Um, it's very much like the uh, the work that was done um, with the uh, nuclear flasks uh, demonstrating safety. The tanks that you need to store liquefied natural gas are very, very, very robust. Um, people are right to worry about leaks of gas. Uh, <clears throat> but we should also be worried about leaks of diesel. Um, and what we find here is that um, uh, people have to be uh, coached, engaged and informed about, first of all, the level of risk and how it is not actually any higher than the level of risk we run now. But the fact that the risk is different LNG, when it leaks, goes upwards rather than downwards. Um, so things are different, have to be managed differently. We've also found that one of the most challenging aspects to be dealt with once we've did, done the design and approval side of the train fitment is working out how to integrate uh, the fueling facilities into depots. Um, we're all used to large yards where we have um, a big tank farm in one corner. Uh, we probably have the uh, dispensing points for the diesel a quarter of a mile away with pipes under the ground. Uh, and we probably have the place where the lorries come in to, uh, to deliver the fuel uh, a quarter of a mile away in the other direction. Uh, that's not going to work with LNG. Uh, it's, not hand, it's not easy to pump around uh, in, in troughs under the under the ballast, um, but it, it's very doable if we approach these things and look at what uh, can be done. Uh, we just have to do it differently. So at Crofton, where we're going to put in our facility, we've done it in such a way that the LNG can be delivered in uh, road transportable uh, container tanks, uh, which are uh, you know deposited on the ground on skids uh, beside, again, the containerized uh, fuel rigs. And the key thing is just talking and talking and talking to fire brigades, to station operators, to dep depot operators, to get them comfortable with what's being done. So we're not the only people uh, playing in this particular field. In fact, we're not the only people uh, working with Gvolution. Uh, and this is a picture of a parallel project being run by with uh, Network Rail, which is to dual fuel uh, their one of their Class 73 uh, locomotives on a trial basis. Um, as you can see, um, we thought we were quite good at branding, uh, but there's an awful lot of branding on the side of that. Uh, they're going to go with an LPG solution uh, rather than LNG. Um, it's slightly less, um, uh, it, it delivers slightly less improvement in carbon and particulates output. Um, 
LPG is heavier uh, than air. So if you get a, a fuel leak with LPG, it goes downwards, just like diesel. Um, but it, the, the challenges are very similar. And you can see how, if you can get that to work for a class 73, it could be quite a uh, viable route for the freight sector uh, to move themselves forward. And there's a lot more that could come here. When you use um, a fundamentally cleaner fuel, you get yourself closer to the Euro 6 uh, emission standards uh, before you get started. Uh, the QSK-19 is um, a fairly brutal engine from a, an injector point of view, um, but it is convertible to common rail. And if you have a common rail engine with, with LNG dual fueling and relatively simple after uh, exhaust gas aperture treatment, uh, Euro 6 on rail is eminently um, uh, obtainable. Um, one of the challenges when you think when we think about greenhouse gases, um, because if we think of this about carbon reduction, while you get a significant carbon reduction, uh, you can also end up passing a quantity of uncombusted methane into your exhaust. Unfortunately, methane is a greenhouse gas in its own right. So if your aim is predominantly around CO2 reduction, <clears throat> then you have to deal with this methane slip problem, which means further work on, on combustion uh, management and potentially methane catalyst uh, in the exhaust. Our particular aim in this project is cost reduction, uh, license to operate, um, you know, uh, societal issues, and particulates emission uh, rather than uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, pro, uh, emissions themselves. But as you go further, once you've got into um, uh, liquefied natural gas, there are many other fuels uh, in, in, the, in the suite of biofuels that you can, be, that you can use. And, and I have seen a, an LNG dual fueled bus uh, that operates on uh, uh, biomethane produced at a local sewage plant. Now, when I wrote this, uh, oil prices were set to rise. Who'd have guessed? Um, but uh, I think we have to conclude that some of the trends we're seeing in the fuel cost market are, are temporary. But natural gas is cheaper than oil products. Um, and it also doesn't get taxed as highly. And that is one of the things that makes a big difference in, in this, in the economics of this. But as we see carbon itself being valued uh, and emissions being valued, you can only see the separation between perceived dirtier fuels like diesel and cleaner fuels like LNG uh, becoming wider. So we've still got a number of challenges. Um, securing uh, an effective supply chain, not outside the depot, but inside the rail environment, uh, it, it still has to be dealt with. So we're doing this at one depot for one engine on one train, um, thinking about how you would uh, replicate that for whole fleets across a whole series of depots. Um, it's a challenge, but it's a smaller challenge for rail to do this, I would suggest, than it would be for um, converting the entire country uh, and all the petrol stations uh, to, to an alternative fuel. Uh, depot infrastructure will be a challenge, but we have seen off-the-shelf modular units that are available. Uh, one of the good things is you don't need to dig enormous catch pits and have uh, oil separators and so forth to deal with with uh, <coughs> diesel spillage. Um, 
The refueling logistics are quite interesting. You can't have long refueling pipes. But on the other hand, you are pumping the fuel across at, relative, at very high pressures. So the time it takes to fill a tank is lower. Range is something we have to optimize uh, in determining what your substitution ratio is because LNG does have a lower energy density than diesel. And as a one thing that this project will hopefully leave as a ongoing legacy is the approvals track that we've trodden and the uh, steps we've made there to establish what are appropriate standards for use in rail. So, so far, what we see is that RSSB have enabled Grand Central and Gvolution to take what I think is a bold step. Um, it's an opportunity to, to prove the case for cleaner, greener fuels in a way that has a payback. We can confirm the logistical and operational practicality of this approach and, that, and establish that there are partners that the rail industry can work with in order to deliver this and to take us on to the next stages, uh, including out, out to Euro 6 uh, compliance for our remaining diesel fleets over the next 40 years. So thank you very much. Those are the uh, points I wanted to make this evening. Um, I think I've answered a couple of the questions as they emerged as we went through. Um, I think there was one about the standards point. Um, Yes, I mean, we wear challenging standards, but it wasn't a case of the standards being wrong. There just isn't a standard for what does an LNG tank on a passenger train need to look like. Uh, so we had to do it through the common safety method, uh, cross-referencing other sectors and doing fundamental risk assessment work underneath. So Louise, I'll, I think I stop sharing and give that screen back to you. Thank you, Richard. Right, so as, as you've heard, we've, um, some of the questions have been tackled, but the opportunity now is open to everybody to submit questions um, to Richard. We've got a fair amount of time available. So if you do need to go, please feel free to, to leave. I appreciate um, these are strange times for everybody. So normal, normal rules are slightly adjusted. It's a bank holiday um, tomorrow. Indeed it is. Um, so if you'd like to either type into the chat box, assuming that you've found that, or alternatively, you can use the raise your hand facility in the participants um, bar on the right hand side. Uh, alternatively, if you really can't find either of those two ways, um, unmute yourself uh, and shout at a convenient time. Okay, so I've noted down there's a, a couple of, of questions uh, which I just need to go back and find uh, where are I Fiona and Stuart that you wanted to raise a question um, possibly easiest if I read out the ones that have been gone in the chat box how much diesel substitution is feasible under idle conditions such as in the station where it's more PR sensitive and there's minimal diesel injection to start with I think I've got that about right. You're absolutely spot on, and it's a um, very, very pertinent question. Um, actually, the technology works the wrong way for us here um, because the, you have to put enough diesel in to uh, create a compression ignition. That's almost a set level. And what you're doing is you're varying the amount of methane you put into the inlet manifold, uh, depending on how much power you require from the engine. So you end up with higher substitution rates when you're working at high load loads and lower substitution rates uh, when you're idling in stations. So we're looking at uh, options there to um, have selective engine shutdown and load up the engines that we're running uh, to maximize the, the, the uh, substitution rate. That's why our conclusion for our long-term requirements do include tri-mode operation where we'd have batteries uh, for that final mile. Uh, not particularly 
a technology not particularly well suited to a diesel hydraulic uh, train set, uh, but probably got a lot of application uh, on 222s and Ridian fleets and uh, Voyagers, which of course have got the QSK19 engine in there as well. Okay, that's... Yes, I suppose that's not counterintuitive, but something that um, is going to be an important point going forwards with the, the need to clean up the station environment um, quite considerably um, to, to reduce the levels of air pollution. Um, I think you, you have perhaps most one of the most difficult situations to deal with with your terminus at Sunderland. Mm. For those people that don't know Sunderland Station at all, it's mostly... Oh, it's almost entirely underground. There is uh, an a tunnel entrance at the north end and a very short gap to, to the fresh air at the south end, but it's quite a constrained, narrow environment. There's a lot of, uh, about 50% of the trains going through are electric Tyne and Wear metro trains and, and some uh, northern diesel services but the HSTs used to fill the entire chamber with uh, with diesel when they uh, pulled away. So it's probably an improvement with, with the, the 180s and a further improvement with the moves that you're putting in place at the moment, Richard. Yeah, uh, and uh, you're absolutely right, Louise, and, and bear in mind that that was with uh, MTU engines um, when, uh, yeah, it was a lot worse when there were um, uh, Valentas, and, but we never took a VP185 up there. But we, do, mm. we did, uh, 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 Sunderland is dealing with the emissions problem in the stations by putting a Greggs and a, a Burger King upstairs. Uh, so the emissions downstairs are the least of the uh, local problems. <laughs> yes, and adding to the waste lines of the locals as well at the same time. Good. Right, I've got a, a, a question I'd like to explore. Um, one of the significant benefits of electrification and electric trains, of course, is, is the better acceleration that they have because of much higher power to weight ratios. Have you uh, understood yet the effects of, of this on the acceleration characteristics of your trains? Uh, it won't have any uh, negative or positive effect because we're, 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 because it's a retrofit modification and we're trying not to change anything. Mm. The weight of the, the overall installation stays the same. Um, the space envelopes are all staying the same. And um, the, you know, the power output uh, from the engine isn't, isn't reduced either. Um, uh, one, one thing that the class 180 does deliver is a very high power to weight ratio. Um, it, it, it goes very well. And actually we've, we've been held back over the years waiting for the IEP fleets to arrive to be able to path with them rather than catching up um, the IC225 and uh, HST trains. So our journey times will improve uh, when all this plays out uh, and the East Coast mainline timetable is recast. Um, but uh, power to weight ratio of modern trains is nothing to uh, get excited about. Um, and actually the 180s were in a pretty good place uh, from that, you know, in their basic architecture, which isn't damaged by this work. Good. Okay, there's a question coming from Peter Vincent. Do you regard this project as purely a trial or as a prototype for fleet fitment? Yeah, ab absolutely spot on with that question. Uh, we would not have embarked on this just for sport. Um, we, we, do, we see that we have a uh, societal license to operate challenge um, with our, you know, being the only diesel operator at, at King's Cross. Uh, we will struggle to keep on um, fobbing people off uh, around our continued use of diesel engines. So we deliberately chose a project that uh, was technically deliverable, um, addressed the issues that, that we had, um, and had a fighting chance of, of having a business case uh, when it was complete. Um, what we wanted to do with the project was to demonstrate that all of the uh, hurdles could be got over 
uh, before we embarked on uh, on a, on a fleet-wide investment. Um, so it, it, it's a trial, uh, but actually in my head, it's a prototype um, and it's a demonstration of feasibility to underpin a business case. Okay, good. So from David Shiraz, uh, are the cost savings entirely due to reduced cost of LNG? And if not, what are the other savings? So um, the, the savings we've, we've banked in our, our draft business case are entirely down to the, um, uh, the lower cost of the LNG. And, you know, let's be brutally honest, the reduced, the lower cost of the LNG is more or less entirely due to lower taxation. Um, uh, rather than production costs, Al although LNG does have a slightly lower um, transportation and, and, and delivery cost than, uh, than diesel because it has less processing involved, um, but it's pretty marginal. Um, we're not banking other savings, but what we can see already from the bench test, the test cell work, is that the engines do run cooler uh, the oil is less um, uh, damaged uh, with prolonged use. And uh, anybody that knows class 180s uh, understands that they are undercooled um, right back from the, the basic design. Uh, and so we anticipate that we might get, that we would get um, uh, longer overhaul intervals on the engines um, and more reliable operation as we, as we, stop cooking the thing. Um, talking to our colleagues in bus who've got a lot more practical experience with LNG operation, um, they, they love their gas engines. Um, they're cleaner. Um, I don't mean the exhaust is cleaner. They are cleaner. <laughs> you know, they're not slathered in diesel. Um, and uh, they enjoy them a, a, a lot um, and prefer those fleets to the pure diesel fleets. Uh, from an operational and maintenance point of view. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Nice to hear things that read across from, from bus to, to rail. Um, a comment, I think, or a question from Edmund. Not, uh, not sure who Edmund is off the top of my head, but perhaps you can spell out your name at more length, Edmund. So an alternative approach could be electric or diesel hybrids, or electric and diesel hybrids, I should say. How does this compare? Yeah, so uh, as, as mentioning our um, specification, our requirement for a long-term fleet, for the fleet that will replace the Class 180s, is an electric train with, um, at the very least, batteries, uh, sorry, batteries to get it off the electrified routes. But our routes are, you know, we we have routes that will probably not be electrified uh, by the time we need to get to the 180s being replaced. Um, so we're looking at, um, we need some form of prime mover. Do I believe that we'd be able to uh, get hold of a, a fuel cell train in 2025? No. Um, so hence, I think what we're going to end up with is a dual fuel prime mover on an electric train with a battery, so a tri-mode train, uh, a battery to get it in and out of Sunderland Station, mm -hmm. a, a, uh, a dual-fueled engine to get it from Sunderland to North Allerton, and then a pantograph to get it to London. And I think that's a solution that you can see um, playing out across other parts of the network mm -hmm. um, a, as well. While we progressively work our way through electrifying uh, those Heineken routes, uh, that haven't been reached yet. It's probably worth saying that Sunderland Station is electrified. <laughs> it is the wrong flavour of electricity. <laughs> the 1500 volt DC electricity, yeah. not yeah. 25 kV AC. Mm -hmm. And that's what the electric metro cars run on. So pan up would be a, either a big, big share of sparks or um, some very unhappy electrification engineer. I'm not sure, not sure which. Yeah. We haven't seen an IEP try that yet. <laughs> All in good time. Um, right.
Right, you mentioned 25 to 40% carbon savings. What would be the carbon savings if you went for a class 800 type buy mode? So the carbon savings are delivered by um, the fact that there, there's less carbon uh, in a CH3 molecule than, than there is in a big cetane molecule. Um, uh, and you can further reduce your net, your, your CO2 equivalent by replacing the, uh, the, 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 you know, the um, well-derived methane with biomethane. So you could actually get your carbon equivalent down to zero by using biomethane in, in the engines uh, and gas to liquid um, diesel. Um, the, the class 800, um, you know, how much carbon you reduce by electrification depends on how often you're running it on electric. Um, so that's, uh, we, we want to move towards an electric train, uh, but not just by throwing away an asset that's still got another uh, 10, 15 years li good life in it. Um, so at the end of, end of the day, we can get to the same level of carbon reduction, even without electrification by selecting the right alternative fuel, which is exactly the conclusion that the IMEC -E reached uh, in its paper this January, was that if we wait for electrification, we'll have burnt an awful lot of diesel in the meantime. If we start moving the existing assets we have onto alternative fuels now, we can electrify in parallel and then replace the existing assets with electric assets. That all makes good sense. Okay, from Rory Dickerson, mm -hmm. uh, are you planning to connect your DAS and would you anticipate further fuel savings or breakware savings from doing so? Uh, yes and yes. Um, connected DAS it, 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 or CDAS um, it, it is definitely the next, the next stage on that. Um, the difficulty is you have to connect with everybody. Uh, you have to connect with some platform that tells the train not only where it is relative to schedule, but where it is to the other trains around. So you ha you're starting to head towards traffic management solutions. Um, so as part of the East Coast Mainline digital railway work stream, uh, we're involved with other operators and network rail to try how do you, how do you integrate ground-based traffic management technologies with train control technologies like ETCS uh, and driver advisory systems on board. Um, and we, you know, as an industry, we should be working a lot harder on that than we are at the moment. Fair enough. Right. Well, I think we've now reached the end of the questions. Is there anybody out there that would like to ask Richard a question whilst we're still here? I'll give you a moment to type I've, something. I've got one. To... Hello. Sorry, go on. Hello, Sam. Hello. Sam. Go on, Sam. Hello, Sam Marchant. Hello, Richard. Um, have you considered using uh, mechanical with the efficiencies of transmission experience in first and second stage. You, you, you broke up quite a lot in the middle of that. Sam. If it was my end. I broke up. Oh no, sorry. Right. <laughs> no, I think it's my end. I've got an issue with the router here. I, I, I was talking, you're in um, the garden. Uh, hydraulic transmission <laughs> is inefficient. Yeah. yeah, I know, I know. I'm trying to keep it quiet. Um, <laughs> it, it, hydraulic transmission is inefficient uh, in mm -hmm. first and second stage. Have you considered uh, mechanical transmission? Not, not as part of this piece of work. Um, uh, our colleagues on Chiltern Railway are, are looking at the transmission end of um, the, the diesel multiple unit um, uh, solution. Um, they're, they're looking to uh, strip out the diesel engine and hydraulic gearbox from one of their trains and fit a diesel electric battery hybrid raft in its place. 
So what you'll have then would be a diesel engine driving an alternator, um, which would then drive a motor, <laughs> um, and which would then drive the final drive, but there would be a set of batteries for storing braking energy uh, in the middle of it all. Um, that's an awful lot of surgery for us. Um, so we're just doing one bit, they're doing a different bit. Let's see how it all joins together. My suspicion is that um, there's gonna be a much stronger business case for uh, sorting out the fuel side. Um, and if we're going to do something as major as rip out the transmission, we may as well get a new train. Thank you. Louise, can I can I ask on behalf? Of I think I can think of a couple Louise, more questions. Can I ask on behalf of the centre if anybody's got any further comments? Uh, I think everybody's got your email address, and they probably would be in a position to email you with comments as to whether this has been okay, good, or otherwise. Yes, I'm sure that's true. Okay, so on the basis that there's no further questions, um, we need to do a vote of thanks. I'm seeing as I forgot to volunteer somebody, it will probably fall to me then. So, Richard, uh, as ever, uh, it's, it's been informative, it's been entertaining, you've clearly got a context of, of why you're doing that, and you've fielded questions from people whom, um, a number of whom would know this sort of stuff very well. So, thank you very much for doing that. Thank you also for volunteering to do this. I know running a business, particularly now when, when you've had to um, furlough your staff, is actually more time consuming and more difficult to do than when it's a normal operation and everything's running. So thank you very much for sticking with us um, and for giving us the benefit of both your time and your knowledge uh, and, and with the clarity also with you being able to, to express it. So thank you very much from me personally, and I'm sure thank you very much from the rest of the committee. Uh, I know it's, it's been a bit of an interesting uh, couple of weeks for us all learning how to use Zoom properly to do this, but I think we'd probably be content to embark on another one of, of these events should we need to do so in, in September. So thank you very much. And if you could join with me in, in thanking Richard, not in the normal way, but I suggest we do so by, by waving our hands because otherwise it'll be quite quiet so thank you for Richard thank you to you all as well for participating quite so um, so willingly and, and so so heartily so I hope you had a an enjoyable time this, enjoy the rest of the summer we'll circulate uh, our pro new program probably end of August or so it might have to be virtual. We're planning regardless. And if we can do it in person, we will. But if we have to do it virtually, we will. So thank you very much, everybody. Take care. And we'll see you in September. Thank, thank you, Louise. And, and congratulations to the Northeast Centre for their approach to this and for all of you participants. A really, really good use of the technology. Best Much time. better than a virtual pub crawl. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Bye-bye. See bye you bye. soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank bye. you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Richard and Louise, and everyone in the Northeast. You're welcome, Andrew. It was brilliant. Speak to you soon. Take care. Louise, just from Scotland, that was fantastic. Really enjoyed that. Very informative and Good. very well managed. So, uh, thank you. You're welcome, in. And, and, and so, Richard, so thank you very much, Richard. Really enjoyed that. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we may invite you to do a lecture in Scotland. That was so, so well presented. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> David, we've got one for next year. <laughs> <laughs> one less to worry about. Yeah. Uh, as a lecturer, a friend of mine um, discovered uh, they had an overflow of undergraduates. So one year he was asked to do a video relay of his lecture into a second lecture theatre. Yep. The next year he worked out, hang on, I've already got this on video. 
<laughs> I'll just I'll just pretend to both lecture theatres that I'm in the other one. <laughs> so Louise has got this recorded. So boom, job done. <laughs> uh, I got about uh, nine nine tenths of it. I stopped it for a while whilst I was faffing around with the technology, and and then started again. So probably ninety percent or so. I think probably after the first few slides. Yeah. I'll, I'll look back on it. Um, yeah. When, when Zoom notifies me that it's available and we'll, we'll see where we got to. But I recorded all of the AGM deliberately to help Richard with minutes and what have you. So, yeah. so that was the, the thing I had to record, but yeah. Um, I, I, th I think it's a, it's a good to, learning. Would you be able to make your slides available, Richard? Because I think one of the things we need to think about doing is, is, is mm. putting those available on, on the websites now because with people finding it hard to, mm -hmm. to, to stay connected, it might be useful for them. Certainly, I'll, I'll email them to you now. Lovely job. Thank yeah. you. Any other thoughts, guys, whilst we're still on, or I shall draw this to a close? No, it's good. It's really good. Oh, Just, uh, I would certainly echo Ian's comments. I think it was a trailblazing event, uh, Louise, <laughs> and uh, a lot of food for thought for us there. Well, we'll talk about it some more on Monday, David. We will indeed. We will indeed. <laughs> By the way, you know Zoom's GDR not compliant, apparently. <laughs> oh, don't even go there, David. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all of this will be in you the Chinese. You just uttered a four-letter word, David. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lee. I was warning you on, on Monday, if you mention it, you might get that thrown at you, that's all. No, no, oh. no, just don't, just don't mention it, David. Just don't <laughs> mention it. Well, we, we did speak though, about... We I did have speak had about... GDPR training come through. Yes. I've not done it yet, but I've had the email. Oh, well, I'm, I'm told we're, we're all supposed to do it approximately every 12 months. Okay. It's the first time I've seen it, so. Mm, well, they haven't sent it to me yet. Yeah, no, we have everything. Two years now, so um, whatever. But, might see um, anybody. Well, there's not that many people on the board. I've just got this book. Oh, brilliant. And it goes up to the 86ers. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if anybody knows a really good book on the 90s slash 91s. I this think that movie. would be two different, two different books. Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the 90s are not that different from 87s. They're just slightly different body shell. Yeah, well, not from 87s they are. They're, they're the thyristic version. Um, uh, yes, I guess the 91s probably are. But, you know, no, yeah, you're right. It would be completely different, yes. Uh, as you can see behind me, there's a 91 the Hornby one. Um, they are like nothing on earth. <laughs> yes. Never to be repeated either. No. My um, interfleet training manual on rolling stock concentrates incredibly heavily on the 91s, which we thought was quite odd, seeing as it's by far and away the most unique thing, probably one of the most unique groups of train locomotives in the world. <laughs> well, you can pop out to Romania, where there's some of them <laughs> running now. Well, at least they <laughs> went there, whether they're running or not. <laughs> can you not? I know the Pendolinos are designed so they can easily be locomotive hauled. Can you not locomotive haul a 180? Uh, the no, there are no 125 electric locos other than the class 91s in the UK. And uh, my conclusion after a few years of playing with them is they are, they are an acquired taste. <laughs> it's the 89. <laughs> that wasn't even more acquired taste. <laughs> and then Tony Brand blew it up. <laughs> well done, Tony. <laughs> Oh, I, I think it was a, he had ulterior motives. He wanted it for the museum at Barrow Hill. That's <laughs> the only way he was going to get it there. <laughs> if anyone wants that title again, it's quite good. It's by Brian Webb and John Duncan. Brian Webb and John Duncan. And uh, seems like it's fairly interesting. Good. Well, I'm I'm heading off now again. Th fantastic, Richard. Fantastic, Louise, and yeah, fantastic yeah. Northeast. So we're away. we'll see you all again very shortly. I'm sure. Thank you. Okay, right, thank, you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much yeah. indeed. Okay, bye, bye, bye. bye. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah. Gin and tonic. Uh, gin and tonic's got my name on it, so I'm uh, I'm dissipating. Indeed, I polished off my birth the remains of my birthday cake whilst we've been on. So uh, so I'm now ready for my first course.
<laughs> Good night, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.